Okay, so now hopefully you will have all have downloaded the link or downloaded the file that I sent around the link in the email and gotten the zip. So if we unzip the zip, as you can see on my screen, you'll be presented with a folder that looks like this that has a few files in it. You have a Mac OS X file folder full of Philips metadata and three VBox images. Now the three of them have just been slightly tweaked depending on the host OS. So there's one for Apple, Windows, and Linux. So, you know, choose the one that's appropriate for your operating system. Um, this is also detailed in the readme, right? So what we're gonna to wanna to do is open VirtualBox. Now I also sent this in the, in the email that you should download VirtualBox. So we're just going to go and open this VirtualBox. Oops, virtual box. And you should get presented with a screen similar to this. Now, this is the old one, so I'm just going to remove you. And so what you want to do now is machine, add, and then in the virtual box, select the one you want. Now, I am on a Linux computer, so I'm going to select Unix, right? And then it should import, and you'll get stuck with, uh, or you'll see an entry like this. Now, before we boot the machine, we're gonna go into the settings and I'm gonna quickly explain a few things that will be important for sort of getting the most out of your computer and so that the VM runs as best as possible. So in here, the most important tab for now is the system tab. So in the system tab, we can specify the amount of RAM that we're gonna sort of partition for the v virtual machine um, and also sort of acceleration. So in, in our case, it's gonna be mostly graphics acceleration. So in the system tab, You'll see here the amount of base memory that you can allocate for the virtual machine. You want to try and push this up as much as possible before your, uh, without really impacting your host OS, right? So I have 16 gigs of memory on my laptop, and so I could give it like 8 or 12 gigabytes, and I should probably be okay. Um, this is going to be a sort of an experimentation for you. I would recommend for most people, if you have like 16 gigs, allocate 8, sort of allocate for half. If you have 8 gigs, allocate 4. 4 gig of, gigs of memory should be fine, but it might get a bit sluggish, right? So try and push it. The, oh, in system as well, processor here. So you can allocate the amount of CPUs that you're gonna give to your um, virtual machine. I would just essentially put it to the maximum that it will allow. In this case, I can give two CPU cores to the virtual machine. Hopefully you will have at least a couple of cores that you can give to it. Um, the most important thing other than that is going to be in the display tab. So we're going to, because we're doing a graphics application, we want to try and um, enable some sort of acceleration, the, the best we can. Even though we won't get proper hardware acceleration, we can get a bit more out of it by, by enabling a few things. So mm. the video memory should be sort of default set to the max. Um, this doesn't really affect it too much or like affect your, your operating system, like your host OS. The most important things here will be enabling these sort of accelerations. Um, here you might also have a few options. Um, I don't really know what each one individually does. Um, like the, the, the legacy, whatever they're implementing, whatnot. But just if it's really sluggish, try and experiment with the three of them or one of them, however many you have there and see which one works the best for you, right? So after enabling acceleration, I'm going to save that. And then I'm going to click start and then your, your VM should open up, right? So I'm going to present it with this guy. We make him full screen and he'll boot. So just give it a second. <laughs> did I start recording? I hope I did start recording the screen. I did. Okay, so you'll get presented with a screen like this. Now in my case, I'm on a 1080p monitor and I think the default resolution is like 1200 or something. So that's too big for me. So um, I'm gonna go down here and preferences, monitor settings and set this down to something more compatible with my laptop, like this, okay. Now up here, you can see in view, there's like seamless mode, scale mode, full screen mode. These will work well for most people to get sort of a more immersive experience as I don't actually have a desktop environment on my computer. It doesn't work well for me. So I'm not going to demonstrate that. Um, you should all be able to figure that out and give it a Google whatnot. Um, 
So this is the basic um, OS that we've set up for you. Um, Ubuntu based for when it comes to Googling things. Um, and then here, wait, where's the reset? Is it, ah, okay. So it's still too big, hold on. I'm gonna get a tiny bit bigger, smaller. Da da da, I need to make it a bit. How are you? Okay, this will do. <clears throat> so I slide him up. So there's these three little um, scripts that we've linked here. Um, what the Zoom does is it kind of makes the whole um, v VM go like full screen and sets the width of your, the resolution of your screen to that of what I've specified in the emulator. So essentially it'll make the emulator your entire screen. And then once you once you kill the emulator here, this will terminate any um, free RTOS emulator processes. You can then reset your screen resolution by running the reset script, right? So that's what those scripts do. You don't really need to use them. It was just Philip being a little fancy. So um, VS Code, Visual Studio Code, this is where you're gonna be doing most of your development, right? So if we give this a double click, you get greeted with an environment like this. So this is where we're gonna be working in. But before I go through how we use VS Code, we're gonna firstly need to go and get the code we'll be running. So we'll open the browser, Firefox. Da -da -da. Now I need to connect to my Wi-Fi. That should hopefully go, yes. Now we're gonna to want to go to the link here, which should all come up, or it's linked in your slides, or it's up here as well. The free that's us emulator. So this is the source files for it, right? So I, um, as I'll explain in the first lecture, you'll you like we want you to use Git through this course. So we want you to to sort of get used to using Git as part of your normal development workflow because it is very powerful, which I'll explain in the Git lecture. So what what you're all going to do is you want to create an account, sign in, or sign like sign in if you have one. Sign up if you don't. You're gonna need a GitHub account. You don't have to give them all of your details. You don't have to buy a pro prescription. Just buy a basic, or don't buy it. Just get a basic free account so that you'll have a profile. Then when you come to here, you're gonna click on this fork button. I can't fork it because it's my repository, but once you fork it, you'll essentially create a copy of it for yourself so that you can actually push, like upload your code and your changes. Um, the details of how forks work and branching in Git will be addressed in the Git lecture slash tutorial. But for now, we need to then, like you need to fork it, go to your repository, not mine, and go to this button, which will look similar. Like your username should be here instead of mine. And then we can take this link because this is where the Git, like where the repository is located. Then we're gonna open a terminal, which you do control alt T, or similarly, you can press this little button down here. Then in our little terminal, we're going to go git clone, and then if you press control shift V, similarly you can right click and click paste, it will paste in that. So pasting to the terminal is, just requires a different key combination. So if we do that, it will start to clone the code. So now what we wanna do, if we go ls, oops, sorry, ls, it will list the directory we're in and we can see that we've got free artist emulator. So these are like the basic commands for using um, Linux or any Unix based system. Like you can use Mac, Mac will have a similar um, terminal commands. So CD to change directory, free artist emulator. And so then we'll enter the free artist emulator directory. And so if you go LS again, you'll see that you'll have files here that are the same as what we have in our, in our web interface, right? So now I'm gonna go and close this because we don't need it anymore. And so in here is everything we need. Now in, there should be a build directory. And so with C projects, the sort of best practice is to have a build directory where you compile your, you run all your compile commands from such that all of the, the temporary generated files get dumped into this folder. So that cleaning up later is as easy as just deleting the folder, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the build folder and then if we go back to our lecture slides here, 
we will see this command here is the one we need. So you'll also learn in the Git tutorial a bit more about CMake and whatnot, but essentially we want to pass it. If you want to use VS Code, and I'm assuming everyone will want to, you want to pass it this, which means that you want to give it the variable use IDE equals VS Code so that CMake knows to generate you all of the VS Code files that you will need for VS Code, right? So we're going to go do that now. Da -da -da. CMake minus D use IDE equals VS Code dot dot. Now I had a bit of a, when I was doing this for the first time, I accidentally put VS underscore code and it won't generate anything. So you need to make sure that you have exactly the right command, use IDE minus D, use underscore IDE, all capitals equals lowercase VS code altogether, right? Dot, dot, like space, dot, dot. Same as what's in the lecture slides. Then you'll see something like this. <coughs> VS, um, CMake will have finished and you should get something like this. Um, build files have been written to and then the location of the directory that we're in, which is free alpha simulator build, right? So then what we can do is that we could build from the command line, which we'll, I'll do now, but we will do this later in VS code. But if we ran make, then it will compile all of our C files and you'll see if we list dot dot slash bin, so this is where the file, the binary is gonna get dumped, we'll see this free artist emulator now. So if we were to run this using dot slash dot dot bin free artist emulator, this is it, you'll see it here running. It's a bit sluggish as you can see, but I think the performance of this, um, at least on, on my system, is decent enough that we can develop, um, we, we can program on this, it's not a problem. If we press C, See this ball who slowly gets quicker and quicker and quicker. And this is the example of a bouncing ball. Um, anyway, so, but we're gonna sort of bring this, um, we're gonna execute this game and build it from inside VS Code because it's a, a much easier development environment for, for getting started, right? So um, what we're gonna do in VS Code is we're going to go file and open folder. So you want to want to, it'll start in your home directory, just select free RSS emulator and click OK because we want to open the entire free RSS emulator folder. And then blah, blah, blah. You should see on the left hand side, these are all of the files. So most of the stuff that you will need to write, like your main.c is in this source folder and there's also this include folder, right? So if you write header files, <clears throat> they should go in the include folder. And if you write source files, they should go in the source folder. If you write and include, if you make a header file and put it in the source folder, um, make won't find it, right? Um, because I've written the CMake such that it will look for header files and include and it'll look for C files in the source. So, but now we've got our C file, uh, our main.c. So if we go up like here, it's quite a large one. You'll see all, this is all the demo code that I've given you and somewhere at the bottom is probably our main here. So this is our main. So our entry point into the, um, the program. So what we can do if we go back to our lecture slides, we can want to compile and run it. So we'll have this in the terminal menu, run build task to just run it, run our terminal run task. And we also have run start the debugging, right? So we'll, firstly, we'll compile and, and just run it. So going back to our VM terminal, <clears throat> run build task. And you should see a bit of a bit of um, output in the console at the bottom. And then here we go, we have the VM. Now, this might not be true for everyone, but I think and I noticed that the VM running in VS Code, I mean, the emulator running in VS Code is a bit more sluggish. And you'll see this even more so when you're debugging it, right? So unless you have like, if you want to get the best performance, if you really want to test your, your game, your application with the best performance, I would recommend running it from the command line by opening a terminal, CD into it, into free art simulator, into the bin folder, and then you can use dot slash and then the binary, and this will run it. So I don't know if you can see, but I feel like this is a bit more fluid. Although to be fair, it might not be, it could just be uh, me. Bit, bit sleep deprived, um, but debugging is definitely slower. So the performance in debugging, it's a bit tricky to balance it. You're gonna to have to debug it when you have an issue and then to make sure that the actual performance is adequate that you can use it would have to be tested not debugging. So, but this is all about part of the, the trickiness of developing code. Anyway, so 
back to our slides, we can see, um, so this built and ran it. And then obviously if we don't need to build it again, I imagine you probably always need to build and run it. So this is probably the one you're gonna use most of the time. Um, this one will just run it so it won't actually compile it. Um, and then, but the most important one for code development is debugging, right? So for those of you who don't really have any experience with debugging, what debugging does is that essentially it'll stop, like once you execute it, it will stop on the first line, which of the program. So the program starts, a C program like any C program, which we should all know, starts at main. And so then this program will pause at the first line of code and then we can step through it. Like you can click the button to kind of go line by line through the code. You can look at the variable values. And if, if you actually have a, like a hard fault in your code, you can see where the the code crashed. So this is how you can best sort of really slowly and carefully go through your code. You can set breakpoints by clicking in this little line here, I think, wait, if we find a line, or is it here? No, here. So next on the left of the numbers, you can click and you create a dot. And then when I'm executing, if this line of code gets executed, your debugger will pause and you can then interact and look at variables and whatnot. But so we'll run this debug target now. So if we go turn, or is it run? Run, start debugging. Mm -hmm. And so it should, it'll like do its thing, create all the threads. And then you'll see here this yellow arrow and this highlighted line, meaning that my code is now paused at, the at this line of code. It hasn't executed it next. Uh, yeah, and if I go up to here, I can see all these different sort of um, commands. So we have step over, and this means that it just runs a line of code, but if the line of code actually calls a function, it doesn't go into the function, it just goes to the next line in the current context, right? So doing this would mean that I go step over would mean it would just run that line of code. So at this one, it did, what this line of code did was it, it called this function and it stored the function return in this in this um, bin folder path. And if we highlight over bin folder path, we can see that bin folder path just contains a slash because that's the current binary directory, right? <coughs> I should also note that because the emulator and with the graphics library is designed to use images, um, like you can load in images. So imagine when you're making your games later and you want to give the, the main character or something a graphic, you can get a bitmap and instead of using a little manually drawn circle, you just use the image as the character, like a sprite, right? So this is how you used to make Mario and stuff by having little bitmap images that changed. Um, because we use images and um, it's sort of hacky, I guess, that, that all of the images are designed to go into the resource folder, we have hard-coded um, directory paths in the code, which is not great, but given the time constraints, it was the easiest and quickest way to get it running. And as such, if you run this program from the command line, you have to run it from the bin folder or the build folder. Like you can't run it from the root. Just FYI. But if you stick to VS Code, it should run fine because VS Code runs it as if it was from the bin folder. So anyway, now going back to our step instructions, our, our, our step functionalities of debugging, we click step, step over, so it went to the next line. Now if we go over again, and we'll get to another here, if we go down to this button, so what we can do is we wanna debug this function, we wanna see what happens in there, we can create a breakpoint, so that we know when it gets to this line, it will stop. Click continue, and it will stop, or it'll, like it's gonna do start some stuff. And then here, we're gonna hit this line of code and it's gonna pause again. And so we're, we're back in control, right? We can look at variables and whatnot. But now let's say we wanna know what happens inside that function. We can use step into. So what this does is the same as step over, meaning it will take one more step in the code. But if that line of code calls a function, it won't just run the function and get the return value, it'll actually go into the function, right? So we're a step into, and it will step into now into Q.C, which is part of the um, free RTOS sources. So we're actually inside of the free RTOS um, source, like the code. We can continue stepping, whatever, or I think this should step out. If we click step out exactly, it will return from that function and go to where we were before. So step in, goes into a function, and then you can go step out, we'll jump back out of the function, right? And then we can continue stepping again. 
So it's gonna continue going, blah, blah, blah. And then we can click play or continue. Since we don't have any more breakpoints, it's just gonna keep running. Now down here, you'll see your little window. And so the performance in debugging, as you can see, it is a bit sluggish, right? So this is something that you're gonna to have to sort of fix up. That being said, this VM is only currently configured with four gigabytes of RAM. So if you are lucky enough, like I should have enabled eight, give it as much memory as you can because this will help increase the speed of this stuff, right? So, but we'll take this into mind when we're setting the project that we're gonna make something that's not gonna be super performance orientated, right? Anyway, so hit Q to quit that. Um, so that is pretty much the basics of setting up the VM and getting it into the development environment with debugging and building and whatnot, right? Um, I should note, I'm not sure if we have a clean target set up. But essentially, one thing that's important to know is that when you are generating, like when you when you want to, if, if you do proper code development in C, you should partition your, your project up into multiple files. So like in, in the free RTOS sources, like if we go to our folder here, lib free RTOS kernel, you'll see here you have these multiple files. And so the developers that created free RTOS, they do all of the code for timers and they put it in timers.c. They put all the code for task and tasks.c. So instead of having one huge file with everything in it, the code is partitioned into sort of like, let's say like the modules that make up the project. And as such, people like you, you and I, we should also follow sort of similar practices that when you're writing your code for your project, if you have one sort of a module, like if you're writing all the code for, you have some main character and you wanna write some functions that make the character move, then you put all of those functions inside the same C file. But the thing is when you create new files and add them to your project, the, the generated build system doesn't know they exist until you rerun that CMake command. So when you create a new include, like a new header file, a new C file, you just need to make sure that you go back to the command line, go back into your simulator, the emulator folder into build and rerun that CMake command. And it will know that it exists again because this during the CMake command is when it sort of searches for files. When you're building it, it doesn't search again. It just compiles what it knows is there. So that's one thing you should just know. Other than that, that should pretty much cover setting up the VM and getting it running. So I'm going to get on now and record the kickoff meeting lecture. Um, I hope this helps. If you have any questions, please send me an email or send Philip an email, whatever. Um, but hopefully this got everything covered. So. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.